center, offensive right corner up. Curry with a one-timer. There was a period of time between the mid 80s and the mid 90s where every year there were at least 15 50 goal scorers and there were 15 guys who would get 100 points. I played in the era with the most talented players ever to play the game and the biggest stars ever to play the game. Gretz, Mario, Messier, Yager, Coffey, Steve Eisman. Peter Forsberg, Mike Medano, Brad Hall. Oh, got a shot, score! One of the greatest snipers ever, not because he was my son, but he could score goals in so many different ways. Oates gives it in front to Hall, a shoot, he scores! Hall and Oates. And Oates for Hall, he scores! Adam Oates put that biscuit on Brett's tape so he could let her go, and he did. 86 times, if you could imagine, and 72 times, and a bunch of 50s. Just about every NHL record for points and goals was set during that 10-year span from the mid-1980s to the mid-1990s that bridged the NHL's last two 25-year eras. And many of those came off the stick of a hockey prodigy from Montreal who would go on to lead his Pittsburgh Penguins to two Stanley Cups at the start of the 90s. I was only 18 years old when I came to Pittsburgh, didn't know what to expect, uh, didn't speak any English at the time. I just wanted to play in the NHL and having a chance to one day hopefully lift the Stanley Cup at center ice. In fact, it didn't take Mario Lemieux very long to leave his mark on the NHL. Lemieux, his first shot on goal, and he scores! After scoring on his first NHL shift, Lemieux went on to win the Rookie of the Year award. And by the age of 22, he was the league's most valuable player and leading scorer, with 199 points, one shy of becoming the only NHL player other than Wayne Gretzky to reach 200 in a single season. Mario is so special because he did the things that guys like Guy Lafleur and Marcel Dion could do, but he was six foot five, and he had a reach that nobody else ever had. Lemieux sails and he scores! Yeah, he was big and he was strong, and his hands were silky smooth, but he was fast. His strides were so long, so where you thought, well, maybe he's lumbering a bit, and he wasn't lumbering at all. Score! That's a Mario Lemieux goal! Super Mario might have been spectacular but he wasn't indestructible. Before he was even 25, injuries curtailed his career. I remember having my first back surgery before the 91 season. After that, I got a back infection where I was in bed for, for three months and I really didn't know if I was gonna be able to walk again. Thankfully, I got better, came back, played 25 games at the end of the year. He had somebody else tying his skates uh, so that he could, you know, wouldn't have to bend over and straighten back up to play. Half the time, he couldn't even bend over when he walked in the room. But he'd play that night, and you'd say, how the heck does he do that, you know? Ironically, it was that injury to Lemieux that opened the door for another future Hall of Fame great to excel with the Penguins. Yarmir Yager is having a night of nights here tonight. Yags was a tremendous talent, but he was 18 years old. Uh, homesick, the culture was so different for him coming from Czechoslovakia. By the end of that first season, he was one of our best players, scoring huge impact goals. And of course he goes on, becomes one of the greats of the game. Lemieux somehow returned for the playoffs that year and led the Penguins to the first Stanley Cup in franchise history. Pittsburgh, 1991, Stanley Cup champs. The Pens followed that up with another the next year, and Lemieux, despite missing five playoff games with a broken hand, led all scorers and was again named the playoff MVP. By the mid-90s, at the age of 28, Mario Lemieux was solidly in the prime of his career when he was forced to face the biggest fight of his life. It was a shock for sure uh, to be told that uh, you have cancer. He 
It was pretty kind of strange. I don't know if I can describe the words. You know, see young man when he heard from the doctors and he said he had to stop the car because he was crying. I talked to our doctors and, and people that uh, went through it uh, in the past. I felt more comfortable about the outcome and uh, it was just a matter of going through the radiation for six weeks and, and I couldn't wait to, to get back on the ice. And then went on an unbelievable rampage. He averaged so many points per game in that last stretch after he came back from Hodgkins that if he had averaged that many points over the course of an entire season, it would have been a 260-point season. Simply amazing. Lemieux would retire in 2006. And while there would be no more cups in his career as a player, he did hoist three more as an owner cementing his legacy as one of the pillars of the league. It was midway through the NHL's 76th season on February 1st, 1993, that Gary Bettman was installed as the NHL's first commissioner. I viewed the opportunity to be at the NHL as exciting, as challenging. My vision was to take the great foundation we had as a game and grow it. And while his influence would be wide ranging and play out dramatically over the next 25 years, it was just after his arrival in 1994 that the New York Rangers, an original six team, ended a long championship drought. The Rangers had come close several times in the past and appeared to be in the midst of coming up short again, falling behind three games to two in the conference final against the New Jersey Devils. But along came Marc Messier. We had lost momentum. We had to figure out a way to get it back. And for me personally, I just wanted the team to know that uh, I really believed uh, that we could go in and win game six. This was headlines on all the sports sections in New York. Marc Messier said, we will win game six. If anyone knew what it took to win a cup, it was Messier. He already had five with the Edmonton Oilers. Messier, shot, score! The man that proclaimed if we will win game six has just tied it. Mark Messier gets his second goal! The Rangers lead three to two! Stanley Cup final against the Vancouver Canucks. Let's go, Rangers! The Rangers won an equally dramatic game seven. As exciting as it was, and as much as we wanted to celebrate, nobody took a breath until that uh, final whistle went. The rest speaks for itself. Like the Rangers, the Detroit Red Wings also wandered through the NHL wilderness for decades, entering the mid-90s, having last won a cup in 1955. Steve Eiserman is the first turning point because you could build it all around this franchise seminal player, but they still needed other pieces. It took Russian pieces, it took Swedish pieces. It was in October of 1995 that five of the Wings' Russian pieces stepped onto the ice together for the first time and promptly revolutionized the game. It's an amazing feeling when you step on the ice, there's Kozlov, there's Fedorov, there's Konstantinov, there's Fetisov, and we start to play the different style of hockey. The five Soviets are out there now playing as a unit. They pass the puck amongst themselves 15, 20 times. It was almost like keep away out there. This is Lariano as they weave and circle. There's Constantino, one touch. Federer fires and score! I was always fearful that somebody could figure out what they were doing because we couldn't ourselves. There weren't many teams that could figure out those wings, but the Colorado Avalanche was certainly one of them. 
From 1996 to 2002, the Avs and the Wings did plenty of fighting, but plenty of winning, too, taking five of seven Stanley Cups. Colorado wins the Stanley Cup! Colorado won first in 1996, and the Wings the next year. bringing Detroit its first Stanley Cup in more than four decades. So for the fans, the city, the state of Michigan, um, to get back to where Gordy and Alex and Ted and where a lot of our fan base expecting it to be was very exciting for us all. Finally, the cup has returned to hockey town. The curse of 42 years finally ends. The celebration, however, was cut short when a tragic accident ended the career of Vladimir Konstantinov, one of the stars of the Wings Cup win. The team kept his locker uh, intact with his gear and uh, had a, a small rock or a stone where it said, believe. That gave us motivation to come out and have another strong year. We knew we have two uh, wounded soldiers uh, not, not with us that season, so we knew uh, we got to put an extra effort uh, for them. The next season, the Wings would take the cup again, a victory best remembered for its heartwarming ending. We weren't aware really until the third period that Vladi was there. Standing ovation for Constantino. And then they brought him down onto the ice after the game. To be there and to be a part of it with us was very emotional. The Wings would go on to win two more cups. The, Wings have won the, Stanley Cup. the first in 2002, Scotty Bowman's ninth and last as a coach. And once more in 2008, with Nicholas Lidstrom of Sweden, the first European to captain a Stanley Cup champion. But while the Wings had once again become a winning franchise, the Chicago Blackhawks, another of the original six, were still trying to find their way back to the top of the league. We had dipped into irrelevancy, and uh, it was it was rough for a while. Ball to the late man Hamlet, the shot. Talk about a renaissance! It was it's staggering. Then the Taze breaking in over the Avalanche line, down the slot. He shoots, he scores! What a play! The revitalization of the Blackhawks began in 2007 with the arrival of Jonathan Taves and Patrick Kane. And here comes Kane. He scores! We're young kids kind of coming into the city. We always heard that if you guys win, the fans will come back and start watching you. So that's exactly what happened. It was amazing to see hockey kind of reawaken in this town as two of the best players in the history of the game were just starting out and there was this awesome team built around them that was young and exciting and fun the kids grew up in a hurry and in 2010 ended the blackhawks nearly 50-year run without a stanley cup i was just trying to not get too excited because i just felt like it was almost too good to be true The Chicago Blackhawks have won the Stanley Cup. But the Hawks didn't stop with just one cup. Three years later, they won their second in one of the most miraculous finishes in the 100-year history of the NHL, scoring two goals in 17 seconds at the end of game six to beat the Boston Bruins. Two years after that, they won it again. Their third cup in just six seasons. In the last 25 of its first 100 years, the NHL spotlight fell on several generational stars. Some who put the puck in the net, and some who kept it out. Patrick Waugh won four Stanley Cups with two teams, 
The first with Montreal in 1986, and the last with Colorado in 2001. While the incomparable Martin Brodeur won three with the New Jersey Devils, before retiring in 2015 as the NHL's all-time winningest goaltender. And Marty Brodeur's the winningest goaltender in the NHL! But as the result of several rules changes in 2005, the game opened up and scoring increased. Once again, shining the spotlight on explosive offensive talent. Crisscrossing, sidestepping a hit, what a move! Russian-born Alexander Ovechkin, a dangerous combination of power and speed, began his career in 2005, the same year as Sidney Crosby, another of the era's seminal offensive stars, creating a rivalry that would intensify as each player continued to excel. Welcome to the Crosby Show, Sidney Crosby, absolutely off the charts. Like a lot of the all-time greats who came before him, it didn't take long for Sidney Crosby to find his place in the league. He topped 100 points in his first year, and by the age of 19, led the NHL in scoring. And after coming close to winning the cup in 2008, in 2009, he became the youngest captain ever of a Stanley Cup champion. Even though I was only in the league for, I think, three or four years, I think you still understand how tough it is, and you don't necessarily get opportunities like that all the time. So the fact that we got there back-to-back -back years, uh, you really want to you really want to make the most of that opportunity. Just a year after winning his first cup, Sid the Kid topped 50 goals. Sidney Crosby with a big 5 -0. But his brilliance isn't found in just numbers alone. For Crosby, it's all about winning cups, which he did twice more the last to close out the NHL's 100th year. Throughout its 100-year history, with all its legendary players and great teams, one thing about the National Hockey League has always been the same. It was when it started and remains to this day intent on the overall growth of the game. We had teams in newer markets, but the philosophy was we've got the greatest athletes in the world on and off the ice. We could do so much more and be so much bigger if we gave more people an opportunity to actually touch the game. And touch the Stanley Cup, which in the NHL's last 25 years happened to 13 different franchises, including more than a few of the Sun Belt cities. We've had the Stanley Cup won by a Dallas, a Tampa, and Anaheim. That tells you that hockey will work wherever we are, no matter what the temperature is outside. We've been to the Stanley Cup final in South Florida, in Nashville. The number one thing that comes out of expansion into non-traditional hockey markets, more players. Austin Matthews will tell you, if the Coyotes had not been in Phoenix, he would not have played hockey. This would not have happened. So we would not have seen this player. Over the years, especially in the last 25, Finding that talent, wherever it may be, from North America to Europe and beyond, has helped the league become the global game it is today. Less than half our players are Canadian-born. 55% is split between European-born and U.S.-born. The international talent pool, the U.S. talent pool. Do you believe it? the Canadian talent pool, which continues to be deep and strong, certainly makes for a better product for our fans. The NHL has done more than just embrace players from throughout the world. Game two of the 2017 NHL China games. Since 1997, it's traveled overseas itself, playing games around the globe. <laughs> And while the recent NHL has grown exponentially, 
As it neared the end of its first 100 years, the league also found a unique way to embrace the sport's roots. It's a rollicking scene in Buffalo, New York, as the NHL has taken it outside, and more than 73,000 are here to witness it. The game on his stick right here. Score! Penguins win! <laughs> it conjures up imagery and imaginations. And they're thinking about their childhoods when they first learned to skate, and so many of them did on frozen ponds. The Winter Classic and other outdoor games have crossed over from a sporting event to a cultural phenomenon and brought the NHL to iconic venues like Fenway Park, Soldier Field, and even Dodger Stadium. We will present a game of hockey, a game like no other. And in the last few decades, technological advances like video replay have enhanced the game, taking the sport itself and even how it's consumed into its next century. 100 years ago, the very thought that hockey could even exist as a professional sport wasn't much more than that. Just a thought. What the league has become since then is a remarkable testament to perseverance, enterprise, and innovation. And of course, unmatched and unforgettable talent. Boy, did they ever play hard. It is a collection of sweat and adrenaline. And what's it for? You'll have that adjective in front of your name the rest of your life. Stanley Cup champion, first name, last name. Lifting the Stanley Cup, we all dream about it. It's in our blood if you're a hockey player. The people you think of, like your grandparents, your mom and dad, the coaches you had, it's not just you getting your name on the cup, it's everybody that's part of your life that got you there. Wayne Gretzky is still and will always be a face of hockey. Bobby Orr is and will always be a face of hockey. But the fact that we have so many young players that can follow in their footsteps, understand what they accomplished in bringing the game to the point that it is, it's not only a compelling story, there are limitless opportunities. I and so many others are happy to celebrate the first 100 years but we're even more excited about beginning the second hundred years.